Hey, good morning, UPPC. It's good to be with you in this uh, time where we're studying. We've been studying for a long time now, the book of Acts, and we're, we're nearing to the last movements of the book of Acts that are oh so important and powerful and complex. And so I want to invite you to open your Bible with me to Acts chapter 21, verse 37. We're going to be making our way into chapter 22 in just a moment. Hey, for those of you who, who just haven't been with us or haven't been able to, to kind of connect all the dots, Paul, of course, is the major figure in the back half of, or the second half of the book of Acts. You, some could argue, apart from the Holy Spirit, is the primary figure, but, but you have other people like Peter and, and, uh, and Stephen and the apostles and all these interesting encounters. But, but Paul is the primary character, and he's making the turn here where he's pre- previously been going on these missionary journeys to start churches and share this unbelievable news about the, the Jewish Messiah, Jesus Christ, has come. And so he's taking it to the, to the known world that we, we know of. We use the, 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 the language of Gentile people. Gentile people. That is the people outside of Jerusalem and Judea and the broader Greco-Roman world, people who've grown up in a pagan country. And today we're going to see how he makes the full circle from the third missionary journey, shipwrecks, getting beaten, uh, uh, his, being imprisoned, to now turning t- back towards Jerusalem, his home city. This is important because there's a lot of context here. He was under the, the teaching of Gamaliel, the, the character in chapter 5, if you remember, do you remember Gamaliel? The, yeah, the, the figure who was respected in the Sanhedrin and who stopped the persecution of Peter and Stephen in, at that time and said, if this is of God, let it, let it play out. And everyone respected Gamaliel. Well, Paul was a student of Gamaliel and Paul was also one of the persecutors of Christians in the first century. He, he was uh, a Jew who was putting Christians to death. And so this is a full circle moment because now the roles are reversed. He's coming back to Jerusalem, but not as a persecutor of Christians. Instead, he's an evangelist, and he is a Christian himself, and he is preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. And so to the heart of Judaism and the temple itself, where he goes... He has just been beaten, beaten badly by the Jews there. The Roman guards step in, they take him into custody, and we enter the scene. Starting with verse 37, let's do it. Luke tells us, as the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, may I say something to you? Do you speak Greek, he replied? Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the wilderness some time ago? Paul answered, I am a Jew from Tarsus and Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please, let me speak to the people. Let me pause right there, and I'm going to set some context here because this is very complicated, so stay with me. Deal? To understand what is going on here, here is the, the context. And it involves a very interesting character who's going to play out in the coming chapters. Commander Claudius Lysias. Claudius Lysias is his name. He's a Roman soldier. And, but he's an, he's an honest, open-minded Roman soldier. He's in a tough position because of the prejudiced Jewish crowd who just wanted to beat Paul to death. Okay. Paul's already been, been beaten up badly because the Jews in the temple had assumed that Paul had brought a, another man named, named Trophimus, a Gentile, into the inner court of of the temple. That was a big no-no. You don't bring Gentiles into the Holy of Holies. The Jewish people are to protect their identity. They are to circle the wagons and keep everyone else out, right? And Lysias, the Roman commander, in addition to what the Jews thought Paul had done, assumed that Paul was an Egyptian terrorist who had rallied up a bunch of people to do harm uh, in the city and to fight back against the, the occupying Roman government. But he changed his mind when he learns that Paul is learned. He, he speaks Greek. A terrorist wouldn't know the language of Greek. And not only can he speak Greek, he can speak multiple languages. And after all this has happened, after all this has happened, you'd think Paul would be like, get me into the cell, okay? Or, or let me just get out of the city. But instead, notice here, and this is what I would underline in your Bible, notice his question. Please let me speak to the people. He's urging him, please let me speak to this zealous group of Jews to which I once belonged 
and now they want to kill me. Okay, I want to help you understand what's involved here, and it's going to, it's going to be a metaphor that I hope everyone can, can follow along, even if you, if you don't track in this way. Uh, it's a no, no mystery that I am a diehard Seattle sports fan, okay? Um, right? Yeah. Diehard. I, ever since I was a little big dang deal. I was, ever since I was a little kid playing on the playground, I was, I was Dan Dornink in the playground football. That's, that's how old school I am. Tight end for the, uh, for the Seattle Seahawks. Um, anyways, one of the most heartbreaking things for us Seattle sports fans, especially as a kid if you've grown up in this region, is to watch our hometown heroes, who maybe we've drafted and we're young but come to all-star status, leave and go to a different city. And uh, you're nodding your heads. I know. There's a lot of pain in this room. Okay? <laughs> sometimes, it's beca- sometimes, sometimes it's because they've aged out, but actually in Seattle's fans' uh, experience, it's, it's usually because they've been offered uh, more money from another team that they can't refuse, or in one case, maybe a, a family connection, but it still involved money that Seattle wasn't able to pay. And my first experience, of course, of this, of this, of this experience, heartbreaking to me, was my favorite player uh, in all of my adolescence, which was Ken Griffey Jr., right? My favorite Seattle athlete of all time when he went to the Cincinnati Reds, apparently for family connections, but also a bigger contract and... and um, and it was heartbreaking. But then on the heels of that was our, our next young hero that was coming up through the ranks in the Seattle Mariners farm system. And then, of course, was drafted and then uh, played for Seattle. Alex Rodriguez, who left Seattle for the big money in Texas. Anybody here remember this moment? Yeah, a lot of you. Yeah. Okay. I was at the first Mariners game, baseball game, when A-Rod came back to town. This is, is, is shortened for Alex Rodriguez as A-Rod. Uh, when he came back to town, but with a different jersey, the Texas Rangers. And I remember, I was on the 300 level, but Judas is the mildest thing that people <laughs> called him, okay? <laughs> we drafted him. We developed him. He became an all-star. He had so much potential and future hope, and, and he was going to be the person that filled the, the spot of Ken Griffey Jr., the kid, and I remember how conflicted I felt seeing him in another team's jersey. Okay. Now, he's not the only one either, and we're just going to go full triggering and, and just reveal the trauma. Okay. Okay. Gary Payton to the Lakers. Sean Kemp to the Milwaukee Bucks. Marshawn Lynch to the Raiders. But then the worst betrayal of all. <laughs> Richard Sherman to the 49ers. It's one thing to go <laughs> to another team. It's something altogether different to align yourself with the devil. Okay? <laughs> and <laughs> I'm joking, of course. But we, we just know, some of us know, really, because of our heart's desire to root for our home team, we, we know just it doesn't feel right to see one of our hometown heroes come back to our city to play against our team in another team's jersey. Amen. And then you, have, then you have the fans who are booing their former heroes. Now, sometimes it's done in fun, but if you've ever sat on the 300 level of a Seattle Seahawks game, you, you know what genuine hatred and venom for, for one of these experiences looks like when the fans feel like they've let them down badly. And the, it's not just screaming and yelling, but I swear they would do violence to this person. Okay? Now, take that that sense of betrayal or at least pain and uh, experience that you remember from just following a team, and that sense of local identity and loyalty to our team and the burning issues of us versus them mindset, and then crank it up a thousand times. Take that horror at the other side, in this case, the entire world of paganism that has been branded into the soul of an entire people, not over a few decades or a few centuries, but one or two millennia. Take the stories. Not the stories that we, we experienced, which are uh, you know, a great experience or a great uh, a Super Bowl run in 2013, or the awful moment when the interception was thrown on the one-yard line in Phoenix in 2014. But 
Yeah. Take, take the persecutions, take the exile and the shame of evil foreign rulers doing unspeakable thing, speakable things to our local heroes, of the foul practices done behind closed doors in pagan temples that we can't even talk about in church because it is so inappropriate and awful, but it involved orgies and blood and dead babies and children. And all of that together, imagine, imagine the level of anger and venomous hatred for the opponent only when you have allowed your mind to sit with that reality on that God-given and God-directed loyalty of the Jews who were chosen by God to be his people, holy and set apart. Imagine that and the horror of everything that dishonors God, everything that lives outside the doors of the synagogue and outside the borders of the Holy Land. Only then will you even begin to understand why Paul had to try to explain why he was wearing a Gentile jersey. And what had happened to him? This is why Paul asks to be able to speak to the very people who just tried to kill him. Not with boos and jeers or name calling, but with fists and rocks. So what does he do? He says, please, let me speak to these, my people. And he tells his story in their language. Catch this, verse 40. After receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd. When they were all silent, he said to them in Aramaic, Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. As the high priest and all the council can themselves testify, I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus. Remember Damascus here in just a second to their associates in Damascus, and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. This is what he's saying. I wore your jersey. I was a Jew. I was the Jew of Jews. I was the best at wrangling up the very people now I identify with, the Christians. And not only did I persecute them, I went to other cities like Damascus, and I took women and children out of their homes, and I took them back to Jerusalem to be killed or to be persecuted. I was one of you. Now, up until this point, he's been all around the Greco-Roman world. He's been up north in what we now know as Asia Minor or Minor or Turkey. He's just come in the previous chapter. He's just come from a celebration with a church of Gentiles, of formerly pagan people who have accepted and received Christ, and he's tried to tell them, I am not going to be coming back to you. I'm most likely going to be killed. And he heads south to Jerusalem to speak to his people. To his people. This is his people. Guys, don't think that this is one of those crowds with a bunch of nameless faces. This is probably a crowd full of people he studied with, he led with, 20 years or more that he was in community with. There were relatives of his, no no doubt, in the crowd. And this angry, violent mob was the people of whom he said later on in Romans chapter 9 that he had great sorrow and anguish in his heart, so much so that he himself would be cut off from the Messiah Jesus for their sake. He'd be willing to be cut off altogether from Jesus for their sake if they could come to faith in Jesus. This was his hometown. These were his people. Of course he wanted to speak to them. He had never stopped praying for them. He wanted to tell them about Jesus. And here we experience the second of three places where Luke shares Paul's conversion story to the Messiah. Now, if you're, if you're a student of the scriptures, if you're a student of Luke and his gospel, but also in Acts, if something happens three times, that's a big deal, 
It's a big deal. He's trying to get a point across. He's trying to be clear about something. And Luke is taking a risk because as readers, we go like, well, we've heard this. This was back in chapter 9. We heard this very same story. He's going to tell it again. And we didn't preach on it back then because we knew this moment was coming. But he's going to actually do it a third time here in a couple more chapters in chapter 26 where he's revealing again the story of Paul's conversion. Why would Luke put so much emphasis on Paul's conversion? It's because it is the template and it is the pathway he wants us to follow. What is that pathway? We'll get to it in just a moment. But he wants us to understand Paul's story so that we too would take the gospel outside our circles to the Gentiles of our time too. How he does that is crucial. Listen to the skill and the intelligence and the spiritual sensitivity that Paul has in how he goes about speaking to this crowd that just wanted to kill him. Okay, verse 6. About noon, he's telling now his story. About noon, I came near Damascus, the very city where he went and and persecuted people and took them out of their homes back to Jerusalem to be persecuted. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. And a man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. Righteous one being the Jewish designation for Messiah. Verse 15, you will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up. Be baptized. And wash your sins away, calling on his name. I want to pause there and just notice what's the very first thing that Jesus commands us upon our faith or experience with Jesus is to, is to get up and be baptized. We're going to talk a lot about this that, that's here. Is anyone in this room who's yet to be baptized, Jesus is saying, you need to get up and you need to be baptized. That's the first mark of someone who has taken on a new identity, a new story in Jesus Christ. What are you waiting for? What a beautiful question. Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name, the name of Jesus. Verse 17 Paul then says, when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Paul isn't doing away with the temple. He's not doing away with the Jewish traditions. He's actually acknowledging this is still how God is present and able to speak to us. Quick, the Lord said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. And this is fascinating because Paul actually has the guts to argue with Jesus. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr, Stephen, was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. And then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to who? To the Gentiles. Now, tragically, this is the end of this narrative, verse 22. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Paul is repeating this story because he wants it to be so clear that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not just for the Jews It's for the outsiders. It's for the Gentiles. That is the mandate. That is the mission. Paul is embodying it. How does he do this? Well, we can take several things here that I think are beautiful and important, and I want to let them speak to you. And however you may feel like this hits you, 
or leads you or prompts you. The first one is this, is he speaks their language. Notice Paul's uh, clarity on not only his ability to speak, uh, and I'm sorry, Luke's clarity on Paul's uh, speaking of Greek, first to the commander, but then what language to the people in the crowd? Aramaic, Aramaic, not Hebrew, Aramaic, as he speaks their language. The Greek language was the language of the Roman Empire. He spoke his language. He also spoke the language of the crowd in Aramaic. And Aramaic was the vernacular for much of rural Syria and Palestine, which, which of course quieted them. It showed them that he's, he's from them. He's from their town. You know, there's something true here for each of us, and that is the people you are most likely to reach are the people whose language you speak. And I'm not talking about like a foreign language. I'm talking about the figurative language of your experience and what you do, who you hang with. It's why teachers are the best people at sharing the gospel with teachers. It's why students are the best people at sharing with other students. One of the things I wish that I had been able to, I have some regret, but I wish I'd been able to do better in my high school years was to invite more of my friends to experiences where they could have heard about Jesus in Young Life Club or, or in our church youth group. Because those were my people, and I spoke their language. Doctors do great with doctors. Lawyers do great with lawyers. <sighs> Who's your people? You like to work out? You like to go to the gym? That's your people. You speak their language. Whose language do you speak? That's the language of telling your story. Do you know this, that according to research from the Center for the Study of Global Christianity out of Gordon-Conwell University, one, of the, one of, out of five non-Christians in North America does not personally know a single follower of Christ. That's millions of people who don't have a Christian friend or even an acquaintance. We think that people know Christians. A lot of them don't, friends. They don't. The percentages get even higher for certain religious groups. I remember years ago, there were, there were some folks in our broader community, not necessarily in our church, because our church is really, I think, emotionally attuned and healthy, but there were some folks in our broader community, even so much so that we got some, some threats towards me on our, on our uh, voicemail system here at church from Christians in the region who just couldn't believe that I was hosting conversations with a Muslim cleric. And just thought that you're, you're aligning with the, you know, the evil one or someone of a different faith. And uh, it was really sad because the percentages of people of other faith, of other religious groups, uh, goes way down in terms of the number of Christians that they know. For instance, 65% of Buddhists and 75% of, of uh, Chinese people in our community, 78% of Hindus and 43% of Muslims in our community do not personally know a follower of Christ. Tacoma's history around relating with the Chinese people in particular is awful. In our five-mile radius, we've done the numbers. 70,000 people don't know a Christian that would share the love of Jesus with them. Todd Johnson out of Gordon-Conwell Seminary, one of the researchers for the study, said that relatively small gestures are shown to have the most fruit. We talked about this last week. But inviting families into your home can have a bigger impact than big mission campaigns. Johnson said, we should really have lifelong friendships with people of other faith groups. It's so simple, and yet it becomes a big deal. We're called to share our story in our language with others, the language of our community, the language of our neighborhoods. It doesn't have to be the actual language of another culture, but the language of common experience and place. What's your language? How would God ask you to speak your language to impact other people with the message of Christ? Luke is emphatic. This cannot stop with you. The message of the gospel cannot have a dead end at your story in your life. It's meant to be shared. It's meant to be taken outside your proverbial Jerusalem. Okay. He speaks their language too. He speaks to their story. Of course, he had to tell them about Ananias, and he takes great care to make sure that we, we know that Ananias was a devout follower uh, uh, of the Jewish practices and way. 
that he was orthodox in his Judaism. Of course, he, he also had to refer to God as the God of our ancestors, very Jewish, right? Of course, he had to refer to Jesus as the righteous one, which is the term that Jews would use for the coming Messiah that they were long awaiting for. Of course, he would reference all of that. And even when the Lord warned him, don't go back to Jerusalem, they won't receive the message, he argued back on the basis that the folks in Jerusalem knew that he had been there and he had been formally approving and assisting in the death of Stephen and other Christians. Of course Paul had to say all that because he knew their story and he knew their context and he identifies with their story. He speaks their language He speaks to their story. See, because you have language, knowledge, and intelligence about the various circles that you're part of, you also can identify and and speak to people's stories. You can do that. We make the mistake, especially for those of us who've grown up in the church, and we were part of the end of Christendom that happened in the late 80s and 90s. As the end of Christendom came, we became infatuated with what I call American obsession with pastoral heroism. This has been destructive in so many ways to the call of Luke and the gospel of Acts is that we thought all I have to do is get my friends, my neighbors, people in my circles in front of a really dynamic communicator, hopefully at a church. And it absolved us of our own task, our own calling to be message bearers ourselves and to know our own stories, speaking of which, Paul knew his story. This is what's interesting to me. Paul is brilliant. He could have started with apologetics. He could have told the Old Testament story in this sermon. He could have done a lot of things to show how important and smart he was, but he didn't. What did he tell? He told his story, his experience with Jesus. In our time, people are moved and reached when we talk about how Jesus impacts us, how Jesus has transformed us. And the third point is is just that. He speaks of Jesus. Using their language, he speaks of Jesus. Knowing their story, he speaks of Jesus, who was central to his conversion. The Jewish crowd thought that Jesus was dead and gone, and this was just a remnant group that was being troublesome. But he, he shares in their language and in their story that Jesus is alive, And he changes people and he transforms people. And those very same people, just like him, go from persecutors to preachers. And he has spoken the name that the Sanhedrin dare not speak. The name of Jesus. And now Jesus has led him to face a mob of people just like the person he himself had been. And let me just close with this. What would Luke impart to us today? What would Luke and Paul and the early Christians want us to take from from this all? Is to share your story with the gospel transformation Jesus has given you and to share it with the Gentiles. Not in a smug, self-righteous way, but in a very humble way, just like Paul has done. Tell your story in the language of those in your context. You're the only one in this room that has a circle of context at your work. You're the only one in this room that has a circle of context and language and story holding in your friendship circle. You're the only one that has your particular impact ability. We're to go and share the story. Now, for those of you who maybe feel like, I don't know if I know my story of transformation with Jesus, that's what we do here at UPPC is we train our people. You're in the training business. You're in the training community of UPPC. One of the things starts tonight, Alpha, which begins the story of understanding your story first in the story of Scripture, but then how does that personally impact you? And some of you need to be blinded by Jesus' light and have a conversion experience, and that's what we do at Alpha. You need to have a personal experience with Jesus that you could share and and give testimony to. Some of us just haven't thought of our story very often, or we haven't thought about it in a long time. The humbling of of reflecting on how God has reached and impacted you, you who do not deserve it. You haven't earned it. There's nothing you can do to earn it. It was given to you as a free gift of grace. This is the call of the people of God for our time to share what Jesus has done for you.
even if they boo, even if they reject you, God will be faithful. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we, uh, we can so often have a failure of nerve when it comes to actually telling our story and recognizing the gift that we have in, in the languages we speak, in the various circles we have, and then using that to share with people, people made in your image. And we need courage, and we need faith, and we need to believe that you are faithful in the midst of that. Help us to have courage as a people to be your church. There are so many people in Pierce County and Tacoma that don't know the love of their creator. And we have a story to tell. And may it be so, so Lord Jesus, that we could, we could fall in the way of Ananias, who would say to each of us today, brother and sister, you've received your sight. You were able to see him because he removed your blindness. The God of our ancestors has chosen you to see the righteous one, the Messiah, Jesus, to hear the words from his mouth so that you could give witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And so people of UPBC, what are you waiting for? Get up. Be baptized. Wash away your sins. Call on the name of Jesus. And believe. May it be so in our lives, Lord Jesus. Especially this next song as we we sing the courageous words, send me. Maybe no other words are, take more courage than for you to send us into our various places and circles so that we could tell our story of meeting you and what you've done in our lives and to be bearers of the gospel story of Jesus Christ. Receive this song then in the spirit of us wanting to be filled with your courage and your empowerment, we pray.